Well, welcome to Vineyard Church, our online service. We are meeting online because of the social distancing with COVID-19, but we're still the church, right? We're still uh, connected in spiritually, and we're still growing, and we're in a series called Not Afraid, because we certainly need that as we go in to not only through this disease, but what the aftermath might look like. We want to be people that are confident, people that can respond well. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever done something for somebody that was significantly sacrificial, and when you did it for them, you were kind of hoping for maybe like a change, or maybe they would make their life count, or maybe the reverse happened where somebody did that for you, and, and, and you kind of felt like, hey, I need, to, I need to respond because of that. I need, to, I need to make my life count. I need to live a, a different way. A great illustration for this is from the movie uh, Saving Private Ryan. If you've seen that movie, you know that this platoon in World War II, uh, they go into the beaches of Normandy. They're, as, they're, as they're going about their business, they get this new order that they need to save this particular private. Uh, he, for, that's a part of the story that uh, his other brothers have, have, have been killed in the war. And so they need to save him. Well, the whole movie is about these guys, this platoon, going through all of these hardships, all of this frustration, all of the challenges. Some of the guys even die. And when it gets to the end of the movie that the guy who is in charge, the platoon leader, played by Tom Hanks, looks at this guy, Private Ryan, and he says, he says, uh, he says, make this count. He goes, Do, make this count. And then at the end of the movie, the Private Ryan is older, and he's standing at the grave of that sergeant, and here's what he says. He says, every day I think of what you said to me on that bridge. I lived my life the best I could. I hope that was enough. I hope at least in your eyes I have earned what all of you have done for me. So he recognized, hey, there was these huge sacrifices that somebody did on my behalf. He goes, therefore, every day I tried to earn that. I tried to live up to what was paid for me. Well, you know, last week, because we've been in this series uh, talking about the coronavirus, last week I challenged the whole church and really all of those who listened. I said, hey, there are people we need to help. The, the, what is being called as the most vulnerable. We need to sacrifice for them. I talked about the showing compassion, that doing self-sacrifice, being a daily blessing. I talked about mutual accountability and how that might inconvenience us in all these different ways of wearing masks or testing and tracing and all kinds of things that we've had to sacrifice. And really, there's been a lot. There's been the sacrifice of people just being quarantined in their house, people missing once-in-a-lifetime events that will never come around again. People that have lost their jobs. Maybe it was a job they've had for years and years. People have lost their businesses, businesses that they've put their entire life and their life savings into. And there's people that have had to delay retirement uh, for many years because the retirement has, has, has fallen apart and all kinds of inconveniences and sacrifices and let me point out, this is the significant part, my friend, that it wasn't for everybody. You see, interestingly, this, this uh, COVID-19 has minimal effect on most people. It's only the most vulnerable. Who is that? Well, the most vulnerable are those who are older. Usually they're saying 60 and above. And those who have underlining health conditions. Underlining health conditions. Those are who it affects. And so we... That's, we did it for them. I love that because it parallels the gospel so well. You see, God sent his son to die on a cross. He lived a perfect life. <coughs> Excuse me. He lived a perfect life, died on the cross, and so that we could live. And then when we live our lives knowing what God did for us, we live to make it count. We live to make a difference. And he says, in fact, if you understand what Christ did for you and you don't live that way, here's what he says. Those who leave Christ are nailing them to the cross again. In other words, Jesus was already nailed on the cross. He did that great work. But when you recognize what he did and then just say, well, I'm not going to make a change. I'm not going to do anything. or I'm going to slide back in. He says, all we're doing is, is putting him back on the cross again. In other words, we're not living up to our full potential. Romans tells us the way we should live. Therefore, I exhort you, brothers, through the compassions of God, to present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy to God, well-pleasing, which is your 
reasonable sacrifice. He says, be reasonable. Think about it. If God does that for you, what should your response be? Well, this is exactly what's going on with COVID. Here, all of these people all over the country, all over the world, they've sacrificed big time. So what should be the response of those who are most vulnerable. Now, the most vulnerable, as I said, are those who are older, those who have underlining health conditions. Now, the most common health problems among those who have been hospitalized and the morbidity is, is that those who have hypertension, it's 53%. Obesity, 41%. That's uh, mildly obese. Uh, diabetes, 31%. Morbidly obese, 19%. Now, it adds up to more than 100% because some people have more than one. But I want you to notice something interesting about this, that the COVID morbidity, hospitalization and morbidity in America is 60% from obesity, 32% from type 2 diabetes, which is often called diabetes because it's related. In most cases, it's because of obesity and 53% from high blood pressure or hypertension. And so my point is, is that these are things that are lifestyle in many cases. Most cases, it's lifestyle lifestyle. So in other words, what should be our response? They're saying, the experts are saying that it's very possible that there could be a resurgence with some of these states opening up. Maybe they're opening up too early. Maybe people won't follow the guidelines. It could come back and and, and be a resurgence. It could come back during flu season next year. There could be another virus, but all of this was done. What should be the response of those who are most vulnerable in the category that they can do something about it? Well, to be reasonable about it is to make a lifestyle change. Say, thank you for doing all of that for me, and here's my response. I'm going to make my life count. That's the right response. What is the right response from the most vulnerable? I'm going to make a lifestyle change. I'm going to show gratitude. Here's three ways to show gratitude. Number one is commit my body to God. Commit my body. Now, that's what the Bible says, that we are to commit our bodies. You see, we give our hearts to Christ. God, put His Holy Spirit comes into our life, but it's our body that makes the big difference here. It says, do you not know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit? God uses our body. He indwells our body with the Spirit who is in you, whom you have received from God. So this is a big part of our understanding of, of who God is and who we are. This idea of, of biblical anthropology, that God cares about our body, that Jesus died for our body, that God the Holy Spirit of God indwells our body, that we're part of the body of Christ through our body, and that our body will be resurrected. You see, some people hold a very low value of the body, like it's not important, and then they trash it. They don't care about it. They let it go. They let it just keep sliding down year after year. It reminds me of this uh, proverb here. It says, I went past the field of the sluggard, past the vineyard of someone who has no sense. And he says, thorns had come up everywhere. The ground was covered with weeds and the stone wall was in ruins. He says, I applied my heart to what I observed and I learned a lesson from what I saw. What did he learn? He says, a little sleep, a little slumber, a little folding of the hands to rest and poverty will come on you like a thief and scarcity like an armed man. And then he says, I went past the body of a sluggard, past the body of someone who has no sense. Gary Thomas in his book, Everybody Matters, took this proverb and then he made a parody of it. Uh, Here's what he said. I think it's it's quite uh, uh, interesting and a little uh, ironic. He says, his cholesterol was killing him from within. His high blood pressure was a tinderbox waiting to explode. He says, his breath was labored and he could barely move without breaking into a sweat. He said he had no time to exercise or to prepare healthy meals. But he lost hours going into the doctor and much money by buying medicines to treat the symptoms rather than attack the disease. I applied my heart to what I observed and learned a lesson from what I saw. What did he learn? Well, a little sleep, a little softness, a life of overindulgence, and ill health will come on you like a thief and frailty like an armed man. Now, when we're challenged with, hey, will I make a decision? Uh, Certainly, there's a part of us that makes a decision for our own health. Say, hey, this is what I need to do. 
Today, what I've been talking to you about is doing it for the sake of others because they were willing to go through massive sacrifice. It's the reasonable service. It's the reasonable response for what other people have done for you. Now, it's ultimately going to come down to your decision because I ain't going to lie, change is my choice. All of us get to choose if we're going to change. Nobody's going to bully you into you. You've already had all of the commercials, all the people that have tried to guilt you and do all kinds of things. Certainly that's not my intent today, is try to make, guilt you into anything. What I am trying to say is, is that it is our reasonable response, and it is ultimately what God has for us, and He has some wisdom He can share as well. Pay attention to my words, for they are health to a man's whole body. You know, there is wisdom that we can find in, in, in the Bible, that we can use that and say, you know what, I want, to ha- I want to be a Christ follower who embraces all of Scripture, and, par- and my body taking care of it is an important part of that. Here's some whole body uh, health. Uh, it means maintain your ideal weight. That's part of it. Now, your ideal weight is your BMI, as most nutritionists and health experts will say, that's your body mass index. In other words, your, your weight as well as uh, your, your height, they have a certain certain measurements, because everybody's different, right? Let me just say as a caveat that everybody is different. That some people, uh, they, uh, if, you, if, if you're like in, have lower income, you're exposed to more uh, uh, poor, poor diet foods, fast foods, junk food. That's absolutely true. If you're uh, a woman who's had uh, several pregnancies, that obviously can make you put on weight. There's certain medications that can cause us to put on weight. And obviously, we have different genetic makeups. I mean, we all know people that, I mean, they can eat a whole pizza. And it seems like they, they, they burn off the whole pizza just walking from the pizzeria to the car. Others of us, we like put on a pound or two just driving by the KFC and smelling the aromas. And so we're all different. But that being said, most of us, it's not those things. Most of it is we move too little, we eat too much, we eat the wrong things. And so maintaining your ideal weight is important. Each of you should learn to control his own body in a way that is holy and honorable. So we, God wants us to treat our body holy, honorable. And it's something that can be learned, let me point out. We can learn to do it. It's something that we can control and something we can learn how to control. There is a learning aspect. We live in a world uh, where there's accessibility to a lot of stuff that is not helpful to us, that, that puts us back and not forward. And so learning is a part of that. Uh, control yourself if you have a big appetite, Proverbs says. And it says moderation is better than muscle. I'm not sure that's the value everybody has in our culture, but moderation is the name of the game, making sure and living with moderation and learning. Here's some things that, some practical things I think that would help if, you, if, you, if we all put those into place. Drink plenty of water. Lots of water is certainly uh, better than probably anything else. I mean, anything other than water is like polluted water. So uh, it, whether it tastes good or not. So just lots of water. I drink polluted water. I, I mean, I think we all do. But, but water is really important. Uh, all cars must have three grams of fiber per serving minimum. This is probably the most important of this list of all. If you do nothing else, to do that. Of course, this is one of the most challenging too. It means most cookies are out, sodas, so many things because they don't have the fiber in them. Uh, don't skip meals because that just causes you to be over hungry. Turn off the TV. We tend to snack when we're watching TV, unless you're wearing a mask. That could be your new thing. And say, I'm going to wear my mask while I watch TV. But if you're not going to do that, we tend to snack. We watch commercials that are, have a lot of food in them. Usually that food's not very good and it works because that's why they do it. Drink less alcohol reason I say that is, is because not only does alcohol have calories, but uh, we make poor decisions a lot of times. We, we, we rationalize things. We don't, we're not on our best game when we start to drink a lot of alcohol. Eat smaller portions and wait a half an hour before you eat again. In other words, give your brain time to register, hey, I'm full because there is a, a lag there. Get involved in some weight resistance training. That's like a multiplier when you do that. It helps things. It changes things, makes it better for you. Don't blame your emotions or your stress or your schedule or your genes. Really, don't blame anything, right? No blaming because that uh, just delays it. You'll make a lot of progress if you just start moving towards that and not get in uh, all of the blaming. Celebrate every win no matter how small. I think that's really big. Uh, we tend to be too harsh on ourselves. The smallest win, 
you know, you're going to order something and you get a small instead of the medium, or you get a medium instead of the big, or you get the light instead of the regular. I mean, any small win, that's a win. And every single decision adds up. Uh, and then, so first is maintain your ideal weight, then commit yourself to regular exercise. This is very important. I know a lot of people, probably most people, are, they're, they're, they're convinced, but they're just not committed. They don't want to take that next step. I like this statement by the basketball coach, Bobby Knight. He said, most people have the will to win. Few have the will to prepare to win. So there's a difference there. No, words, I'm going to do what it takes to prepare. There is a preparation that goes in to winning. And having this idea of I want to exercise is so important because today, especially today, when we have such sedentary lives, Different than the New Testament days when people, uh, they, they had manual labor jobs, most of them. They, they walked everywhere. They ate better. Their food was more from the ground and more whole. Uh, they had less stress in their lives. We're not in that situation. And yet he says, dear friend, and I pray all goes well for you. I hope you are as strong in body as I know you are in spirit. In other words, the value there for the body, it's not something, I don't know where that has gotten into some, some Christians, they see the, value, the body is lower. That's actually Gnosticism. It was a cult that, w- that grew up around the second and the third uh, uh, AD around, uh, you know, as kind of a parallel to Christianity and eventually got pushed off, but it's kind of taken a resurgence. We don't call it Gnosticism, but when we separate it and say, oh, the body's not as important as the spirit and what God is doing in our soul. No, that's actually incorrect. He says, no, I want you to have a strong body. I came across a couple, uh, what kind of, I guess, a joke about uh, how, how we know when we're not in shape, when we're not caring for our body. And so I wanted to share them with you. When you feel like the morning after and you didn't go anywhere the night before, some of us know how that feels. When your knees buckle and your belt won't. Oops. Uh, when you see your friends running and you hope they twist an ankle, when there's kind of like a, a little meanness or competitiveness, when you breathe harder walking up a set of stairs than you do when you hold your sweetheart's hand, we want to be healthy. We, I mean, that should be our goal as Christ followers, much less the fact that we want to have a reasonable response to what everybody has done all over the world for us. If you're in the most vulnerable category, why don't most of us exercise? Well, it's simple. Why don't I have the time? It's time. That, that's our, I don't have the time. I don't have the time. It's funny that 3,000 years, years ago, they were saying the same thing. I had no time to care for myself. Written way back 3,000 years ago. I don't have the time. Time is something we have to create. We have to make it. And so uh, we want to maintain our ideal weight, regular exercise, and then sleep and rest. So important that we have rest. We all know the difference a good night's rest can make in our life. It can be a game changer. It is in vain that you rise up early and go to bed late, eating the bread of anxious toil, for he gives to his beloved sleep. In other words, it's a gift. Having rest, being able to sleep, being able to rest soundly, that certainly is a gift. Here's some of the things that we get from it. Physical recovery, we're less irritable, it builds up our immunity. We all need that with the uh, COVID going around, makes us more creative, strengthens our memory. Those are all things I think we would want. That comes from getting sleep. So what can we do? Uh, Sometimes habits make a big difference. What can we do in order to have better sleep? Well, you can go to bed at the same time every night. You see, your brain has three clocks in it. And the most important one is set based on when you go to sleep. And so going to sleep and setting that clock is, is vital. You know, in the Bible, it says that the day actually begins the night before. Maybe that's why. I had a job a number of years ago where I was required to come to work at Monday, Wednesday, Friday at four in the morning. It was, I stocked merchandise. And then Tuesday and Thursday, I was required to be there at two in the morning because those are the days they opened up a little earlier. And so it just threw my schedule off constantly. It was so hard. It was the hardest part of that job was that crazy schedule because I could never get it right. I never was able to go to bed at the same time every night. Uh, Darken your environment as early as possible. If you've ever gone camping and there's a fire, uh, you start to get tired just sitting around the fire because it allows 
the melatonin to start to build up. It takes about two hours for enough melatonin to build up. Well, in our, most of our homes, we have the TV blaring and we have the lights full blast and then we turn everything off. Well, it just doesn't work like that. We need time. So maybe you should invest in some dimmers and start turning lights off in the house and, and, and turning the TV off certainly wouldn't be, wouldn't, be a, wouldn't be a bad idea. Be comfortable. In other words, get, you know, having a comfortable bed, making sure uh, that you're, you have a quiet place for you to sleep. Turn on a fan if you need to. Beware of sleep medications. Those actually throw off our whole sleep architecture, throws it off because we're zonked out, but we're, it actually messes up our dream life. And so that's part of the restoration that doesn't happen with that. Avoid caffeine after three. Now, I don't want to get in between you and your caffeine. Nobody better get between me and my caffeine. But this is where it needs to stop because caffeine actually has these inhibitors that disrupt sleep and that need to, our brain needs to be able to, to uh, have all that out of our system so that uh, we can sleep properly. And so that, that gets in the way of that. Get exercise during the day, particularly if you have a desk job. If you have a desk job and you're just sitting there sedentary, you need to get up, you need to exercise. I saw my nutritionist uh, right before this COVID thing happened. And I told her, I was struggling with some injuries. I said, I have a hard time exercising right now and it's really frustrating me. I was missing my goals. And she goes, well, you can at least walk, right? And I said, well, I have a dog. Can I walk that? She walked the dog. Well, since COVID, that's what I'm doing every day, right? My dog loves the COVID thing because she's getting walked all the time. But just getting up, doing something makes a huge difference. And then learn how to relax your mind. Don't think of stressful things. Don't watch stressful things. Don't read your, how your 401k is plummeting right before you go to bed. That's just going to cause you more stress, cause you not to sleep well. In peace, I lie down and at once fall asleep. That's a blessing to be able to fall asleep quickly. For it is you, uh, it is you and none other, Yahweh, who makes me rest secure. In other words, not only do you fall asleep quickly, you stay awake, stay asleep. Maybe you wake up here and there for different reasons, go to the restroom or whatever, but you you're able to sleep because you're secure in what God's doing for you. And so this is a blessing that God has for you. So first of all, uh, I commit my body to Christ. Number two is know my numbers. If you're going to set any goal, you need to know your numbers. You need to know your starting place. You need to know how you're progressing. You need to be able to set some goals. This is so important, but it takes a certain amount of humility to say, hey, I can't do this on my own. I need some help. Uh, I need to know my numbers. There's apps that you can download, like there's a great app called Lose It. There's many of apps. There's different ways, but you say, I need to know that. The biggest reason we don't want to know our numbers is the barrier is, is pride. That's what gets in the way every time of us being willing to change. In other words, saying, I don't really have that big of a problem. Uh, you know, uh, it's not my fault that I'm part of the most vulnerable category. Uh, I didn't ask anybody to sacrifice for me. Uh, whose problem? I don't have a problem. And, and, and just getting into this pride, letting it affect us. Uh, we don't call it pride, but that's what it is. Instead of just saying, you know what? I really need to know uh, my numbers. I need, to, I need to take care of this. I need to do something to make some progress. It says, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought. In other words, he's talking about pride there but rather think of yourself with sober judgment. In other words, you need to just be a realist. Hey, let me know my numbers, exactly what it is, in accordance with the measure of faith God has for you. So not only do you need to know your numbers, but faith is an important part of that because that's part of any goal that a Christian sets. That's We're acting that out in faith. It's something we're setting out, saying I'm trusting God's going to help me with this, and I want to move towards that, whether it's a financial goal, whether it's a health goal, all kinds of goals, relational goal. We want faith as part of that. Faith is key because it predicts. It's a predictor of our future. Limited faith means a limited future. Unlimited faith, on the other hand, this is unlimited future. Who said that? Well, Jesus said that. Jesus says that a number of times. This is, I love this one when he says, according to your faith, it'll be done unto you. What's it going to look like in your future? You play an important role in that. Your faith plays an important part of that. So the measure of faith, that word measure is where the, we get the word metric. In other words, we play, there's accounting, there's, a, there's an ability to say, okay, I want to grow, and so I need to measure what I have and add faith to it. I want to grow in that area. But I'm, I ain't going to lie, I can only manage what I measure. If I'm not willing to measure it, it's, it's really unmanageable. 
So that's an important part of moving forward, of saying, I want to have a reasonable response. I want to do my part. Here's some things that you can do. First, record your progress. So that's important. You want to, but in order to do that, you got to know your starting numbers. So you get your starting numbers, set a goal, and then start, uh, start pro, you know, seeing your progress. And here's some things that are starting goals, knowing what's my BMI. Uh, there's apps that show you how to do that real easy. You can just search it. It'll come right up. Blood pressure, your blood sugar, your cholesterol, all these things. These can be very, very important because you're moving towards full body health, full body health. And, uh, and, and this is important so that you can say, God, I want to be, I want to commit my body to you, but I need to know my numbers. And then lastly, uh, I want to uh, fire up my enthusiasm. Enthusiasm is key because just being positive is not enough. Now, positive is better than the alternative, just being negative. I'm against stinking thinking, always being negative, always looking at the glass half empty. I don't think that's helpful for anybody. But listen, positivity has its limits. It's because there's some things that just aren't all that positive. COVID-19, all the things that have happened. That's, it's hard to be positive around that. If your spouse ends up getting leukemia or something, that's hard to be positive. If you have a child that gets killed in Afghanistan, hard to be positive about that. You see, positivity only gets you so far. That's why we need enthusiasm, which I'm taking that from uh, what that means, which in the Greek, in theos, theos is where we get our word theology. It means God. In other words, in God. When we vest ourselves in what God has for us, he will get us through that. He'll help us out. Now, whenever you're going to do any goal setting, for any reason, you're always going to get a pushback because it's not easy. We find ourselves where we're at because there's, there's forces coming against us. And one of those big forces is Satan. He wants to take you out. Make no mistake, he does not want you to succeed. If he can't keep you from heaven, he's going to try to keep you from being effective on earth. He'll do whatever he can. He'll use different tools. And poor health would be one of those tools that Satan certainly could use. From that same book that I quoted from earlier, Gary Thomas's book, Everybody Matters, he says this. He says, quote, Satan may attempt to ruin one man's ministry by luring him into a financial trap that will ultimately become a crime and thus wreck his business and his reputation. He says he may attempt to ruin a woman by gradually filling her mind with thoughts of fantasy towards a co-worker and thoughts of malice towards her husband so that she is weakened and enters into an immoral affair. Those are two options. Then he points this out. He goes, and he may, he's talking about Satan, Satan may get others to eat one too many bacon cheeseburgers. We wouldn't normally think that, right? Bacon cheeseburgers without any corresponding exercise and take them out of the way. What if it is God's plan for you that you live longer so you can have a greater effect? He closes, he says, he doesn't care what brings our ministry to an end. He just wants it to end. He'll use anything he can. And for some people, he is using your health. What if God's plan for you is to have a, a, a loving and serving influence in your kids, your grandkids, even your great-grandchildren? What if he wants you to have a ministry that is fervent and strong into your 80s and even into your 90s, but you're unable to do that because your body can't keep up? You see, God wants us to care for our body, commit our bodies to God, to know our numbers, to fire it up with enthusiasm, but I ain't going to lie. My power source is found in Christ. Positive thinking is not enough. The reason we're stuck, so many of us, where we're at, is because we're trying to just be positive about it or just have given up, thrown in the towel, all kinds of things. That's why I gave you a lot of practical suggestions. But ultimately, it's going to God and saying, God, I need your help to get where I'm going. Uh, last verse, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fever. In other words, he's talking about enthusiasm and fire it up, serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer, joyful in hope. In other words, no matter how bad it gets, the world all around could be doing a terrible job. You have the World Health Organization. Maybe they're not doing everything that they could be doing. Maybe it doesn't matter who's in the White House. Maybe it's a Democrat or it's a Republican. Or, or all, you, you can look all around and we have these, these things. But you see, what God's doing in us, that's what's important. And he says, no matter the affliction, the affliction, he says, patient, no matter what's going on, God's got a plan for me 
And he can bring good out of stuff that's bad. And then he says, fervent in prayer. We need to stay faithful in prayer, excuse me, that we need to stay in prayer, focused on God. God, you are our source and you're the one who's gonna get us through this. Let's bow our heads and pray. God, I thank you right here, right now that you can make a difference. What we've been talking about today, many of us have had false starts. We've tried it. We've fallen to the wayside. We're not where we want to be. We're not even sure how to move forward. And so it really begins with just going to God. God, would you say, God, fill me up with hope again. Restore my faith. If you're part of the most vulnerable category, particularly those of you who are uh, with these um, some of these uh, illnesses, these diseases that are impacted by lifestyle. That's not the only reason, but that's part of it. You say, God, give me a humble heart. Help me to put the excuses aside and be grateful and respond reasonably by committing my body to God. If you've never done that, maybe you've asked Christ into your heart, but you've never committed your body to God. Would you do that? Say, God, today I want to commit my body to you. Help me to not fall into those, those heretical ideas of Gnosticism and these things where I'm, I see the body is lower than my spirit. But that you dwell in it. You died for it. It's going, you're going to resurrect it. And you say, God, give me the humility to know my numbers and to start stepping out. And then ultimately, I want to pray that you have enthusiasm, the that God is within you. If you've never put your faith in Christ or maybe you're far from God, would you do that right now? Right now, just where you're at. Just say, whether you're in the kitchen or you're in a bedroom, you might be in a workspace, wherever you're at. You say, God, today I want to put my faith in you. Today I want to put you first in my life. Thank you for dying on the cross for me. You say, God, forgive me my sin. Give me new life. Let me pray for you. God, give them hope. Give them a passion for life. Lord, I pray for those who, have, who, who Satan has been harassing in so many ways. God, break that in Jesus' name today, Lord. I pray that you would set them free and help them to walk in the strength and the power of the Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, amen. Well, I'm so thankful that we could come together, even if it's like this. This is unique, and it'll be something for the books, right? And for those of you who made a decision for Christ or you'd like prayer, let us know about that. There's a place for you to say, hey, I'd like some prayer. If you've made a decision for Jesus, say, I committed my life to Christ. Let us know so we can tell you about your next steps. Thank you for those of you who are, who are helping us and serving through giving. Here's the formats that we've given you. Uh, you know, there's a give button if you're on Vineyard Live. Uh, you can also text to 45777 and put your gift into there. Easy way to do that, vineyardchurch.com and, of course, a check. But thank you so much, and may the Lord bless you. See you next week. Thank you for joining us on our Vineyard Church stream. If you prayed that prayer with Pastor Andy, we want to hear about it. We want to support you. We believe that it's the best decision that you can make. If you're on the Church Online platform, click that button that says, I committed my life. And that will take you to a Connect Card option where we will be able to send you information and support this new decision. If you're on Facebook, let us know in the chat or send us a private message. We would like to send you the same information. Hey, if you call Vineyard Church your home, you can actually give online right at our website, vineyardchurch.com, or you can text. You can text 45777 VCC plus the amount and give right there on your phone. We have been doing so much in our community just because the building is closed doesn't mean that we're not reaching out with our food pantry, financial resources, and giving people food gift cards so they can eat during this season. If you'd like to support that, just click the COVID-19 option. And hey, we also want to pray for you. If you have prayer requests or praise reports, send those in. We know it's a crazy time. We want to support you spiritually. You can send those to vccprayers at gmail.com or right there on our website, vineyardchurch.com. Just click prayer. If you're on the church online platform, you can actually get live prayer right now by clicking the prayer button. You'll immediately be connected with one of our prayer team members who would love to pray for you right now. Stay connected with us on social media. You can follow us at Vineyard VA on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. But hey, we're doing this next week. We'll see you right here on this platform next week. Invite somebody out. We'll see you then.